Hi, everybody. Uh, Jason Silverman here in the CCA studio. I uh, wish you were here with us. Um, instead, we've got the CCA living room back again. I think we're around 41 or 42 different presentations in the living room. This one is especially dear to my heart. Um, we are going to talk about what is democracy with the filmmaker, writer, activist, musician, theorist, um, hero, Astra Taylor, um, and Paulina Malinka, a filmmaker and educator. Really excited to have them both here. This is part of our ongoing um, now, um, uh, sorry, series with uh, the National Organization for Women, the Santa Fe chapter. Um, I think some of you are out there. Thank you for being our, our partners for all this time. It's really great to work with you. I know Janet was gonna join us. Maybe she'll pop in later to say hello. The work that now is doing is so essential to our healthy community. Thanks for all that you do and for partnering with us on this program. Um, we have more now programs coming up in the next couple months. Um, check our website to see those. All kinds of great stuff coming up in the living room, ccasantafe.org. We have decided to make these programs free because we want everyone to be able to see them. Um, there are costs associated with us doing these programs, film licensing and honoraria sometimes. You guys didn't hear that Astra and Polina. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and um, and so if you would like to support the living room, I'm going to post this offer here. You'll see it in your little sidebar. Um, if you click on that Donate Now button, it'll open a new tab. You don't have to donate during the program and miss a word of this excellent um, conversation. Um, but if you want to support us, we would love to have your support. Um, click on that, and then um, you can make a donation anytime during or after the program. Um, we'll leave that up for a little while. Um, yeah, and so thanks again. You know, we're in this really incredibly um, intense moment in our democracy. One thing that it allows us to do is to consider who we are as citizens. Um, and I know there's been a lot of deep thought about that, what it means for us to be living in this democracy, the perils of democracy. Um, this film, What is Democracy, does such an incredible job of exploring that. We're really grateful to have Astra Taylor with us here. Astra is known for her explorations of philosophy, debt, and um, public participation. Uh, we played her documentary film, Zizek, 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 sorry. My... You got it pretty close. It's okay. good, Zizek. <laughs> <laughs> um, about the superstar philosopher um, and her books, Democracy May Not Exist, but we'll miss it when it's gone. Um, and the pe People's Platform, Taking Back Power and Culture in the Digital Age, are, are powerful books. Um, the second one won the American Book Award. She's written for The New Yorker, The Guardian, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so please welcome Astra. And um, Paulina Malinka is, oops, um, her bio just disappeared from my screen. Um, she's the former education director at the Citizen Jane and True False Film Festivals. She teaches digital photography and cinema and social change at Stevens College, a former Royce Fellow. Um, her film, uh, China Portraits, has played around the world. We're really grateful to have you guys both here. Thank you, Paulina and Astra. Turn it Thank over you. to Paul. I think we lost Astra for just a minute, but I'll start by um, saying thank you to you, Jason, for organizing this and to everyone who worked behind the scenes, I think. Amara Nash and Janet Williams and the Center for Contemporary Arts and to the National Organization for Women and for all the, that the Santa Fe chapter is doing and the national chapters are doing together, as you said, so important for this moment and for our democracy and that's what we're gonna be talking about. Um, I am so happy to be with my dear friend Astra whenever she returns. Um, while we're waiting for her to come back, one of the things that I wanted to do was, um, so I uh, ran a democratic school, a, a nature school uh, called Wild Folk. And one of the practices that I um, love so much that we were able to incorporate into our school is something called a land acknowledgement. And uh, for those of you that might not be familiar, a land acknowledgement is an opportunity to uh, give thanks to the ancestors and um, indigenous peoples who stewarded the lands that many of us are on. Um, I'm an immigrant to this country. I'm, I'm in Missouri right now um, in the U.S. And um, so a land acknowledgement acknowledges the, um, not only celebrates the, the peoples who are here originally, but um, also um, 
takes a moment to really confront the oppression and unjust removal and um, pain that has been caused to those people. So where I am, the Chickasaw, the Iowa, the Missouri, the Osage, the Lini, the Oto, and the Quapa were the uh, native peoples who stewarded this land and who were forcibly removed from it. And I encourage you, wherever you are, to learn about the history of the indigenous peoples who stewarded the land that you are on that we um, so benefit from today. And I wanted to start off with that because um, something that Astro's film does so well is ask us to think about this larger historical context, the longer now um, as her film uh, positions us in thinking about the present moment and ancient mm -hmm. Greece. Um, so a land acknowledgement does some of that work too. Um, so that was one reason for me to do that. Um, the other reason is I um, something that is a big revelation in Astra's film for me was um, she is speaking with Silvia Federici, who's a brilliant scholar. And uh, Silvia mentions that this idea of self-rule and self-government is actually a idea that is brought to Europe from the Americas, from the indigenous peoples of the Americas. And um, I thought I found that really fascinating. And um, Astra goes into that more in her book. Um, so for those of you who are interested in that, look at that. Um, I'm hoping that we can catch you. Are you there? I'm, I'm here, Yay! I can hear everything. I am here, I can hear every word, but I seem okay. to have no power over <laughs> my very uh, terrible internet. But um, wow. so is... I'm here and I'm, I'm listening to everything. And actually, you know, I think one oh, take okay. one <laughs> reminder is that even in filmmaking, the the sound is more important actually than the image. And so, you know, as long nice as we name. can hear it, we're here together. Um, yeah. I wanna, I'm, there's so much in, in your opening volley, my friend. And I guess I wanna, you know, thank um, Jason and company for giving us this virtual space. And I just wanna say what a huge honor and what a visual pleasure it is to see my old friend, Polina, um, and to be in conversation with you and I think you know, one can get a little bit rote in their Q and A's and their responses to things. And already you're making me think of the process that led me to making this film in a completely different way, or just a little bit outside of my, um, the story I've started to tell myself. So for the audience, you know, Polina and I became friends our first day at college at Brown University. I mean, I was 17 and I saw Polina and used, I think I have, in my opinion, I have like a sixth sense and it's something I put to use in what is democracy where I feel like I can see people that I want to talk to. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mm -hmm. picked Salam, the girl at the refugee camp at Piraeus Port out of a crowd of 600 people. I picked the bead who's there uh, at another a camp at the abandoned airport, also out of a crowd of, you know, hundreds. And sometimes I, I have this spidey sense about someone and I had it about Polina and tracked her down and she became my first film teacher and a huge mentor to me. So I just wanna um, thank you for that because you really have, were my first and only film teacher and Aww. you know totally transformed my life because I have loved to make films even if I haven't made very many of them. Um, yeah. Thank you. I mean, my dear just, friend, yes. So good to be with you. <laughs> it's really good to be with you. And it's thinking, I think there's so much in your question. I mean, on the one hand, there's the political theory part about um, the gift of indigenous political philosophy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a very real story that's important that we need to tell. And it's part of the story that's in the land acknowledgement, which is the story of dispossession, the story, mm -hmm. of the dispossession on which this democracy is, is founded, right? Mm -hmm. And when you understand that story, you see everything about this country differently. You know, the American Revolution, in part, wasn't it wasn't just this revolution of the colonies against the oppressive British Empire for freedom. It was part of the frustration with the crown was that the British crown was trying to stop, um, you know, not stop entirely, but slow down the theft of inter uh, indigenous territory and honor some of the treaties. And so, you know, this revolution was all, uh, American revolution with, that was about freedom for some. And for some people, it was the freedom to dispossess others. And so there are these tensions mm -hmm. um, that, you know, are, are um, intrinsic to the democracy we're living in and that still drive us today. And I think 
that shift that you're talking about that Sylvia Federici talks about, you know, what's powerful about it is she adds another dimension to the story. And it's, I guess it's a, a I would sort of, I could summarize the parable very succinctly, which is if you're living in Europe under a monarchy, the idea of equality is completely foreign to you. There is no equality. You know, uh, peasants don't have a say. They don't mm -hmm. have a say over the king. The idea of the people having will and and being um, uh, needing to be consulted, right? Is an, is that that radical idea had to be invented and then mm -hmm. fought for, mm -hmm. and um, and part of how that idea of equality took hold is because settlers saw it when they went to the the new world, right? Mm -hmm. The so-called mm -hmm. new world. And they saw people living without kings. They saw people living as equals. And mm -hmm. so this galvanized an incredible um, intellectual and creative frenzy where people started writing plays and started talking about this because it was something that they had seen, um, they had seen in action um, uh, only by getting the vantage point of a different society and a different culture. And so we, I think when we, we think about um, that period, we have to understand, you know, what an enormous gift of political philosophy that is, and and the indigenous democracies that were present here, and that literally influenced the formation of the United States. I mean, the founding fathers were well aware of Haudenosaunee mm -hmm. <laughs> democracy. Right. Um, so I think it's important to think about that. But then I, I don't know, the last thing I'll say before we yeah. end it back is. You know, thinking about the ancestors, and I think right now we're in the, when this intense moment, as Jason said, and I think part of the intensity of it comes from feeling that we're really in time, right? Mm -hmm. We're in like we're living in a moment in history that mm -hmm. you know is feels pivotal. We are actors in time, and there's a sense of, I mean, for me, the sense of um, uh, being a link in this chain and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thinking of myself as both. Um, inheriting this tradition of democracy mm -hmm. and wanting to build on it. And then also being, maybe now it's being middle-aged, but also being an ancestor and wanting to be a good yeah. ancestor and wanting to pass on something better for people who come after me. Um, you know, I used to be the baby activist in the scene and now I'm the 40 year old mentor to my 20 something year old comrades. And I'm, you know, I want, um, I, you know, I, I wish, for them a better world. And so I think there's that, um, there is for me this really important dimension of time to democracy. There's a whole chapter on time in the in the book that was my favorite to write that mm -hmm. democracy is, um, it's got this temporal component because we live under conditions and constitutional rules and laws made by people who are dead. And we act in the present and somehow we mm -hmm. need to figure out a political system that brings to the table the generations to come. So this mm -hmm. temporal, I, I'm feeling the temporal <laughs> tension of democracy really deeply these days because it feels like this is such a, a vital and, you know, dangerous moment. Yeah. And it's this moment where I feel it, it would, you'd be hard pressed to not feel like it's this moment of reckoning and, and this moment mm -hmm. that we are experiencing quite differently and tragically so, but we are experiencing this moment together. Mm -hmm heightened by, you know, a pandemic that is transnational, does not care where you are, you know, and yeah. does care who you are, but um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, was, I, I also wanna go back to this idea of the land acknowledgement being both this seed of hope and this despair, because we acknowledge the, you know, we, we, we have to face colonialism and we have to face the, the genocide that happened to found this country. Um, but like you said, we also have, you know, huge activism from within the indigenous community and survivors from the indigenous community. And we have this historic antecedent. We have, we have, you know, we have something to point to this lived experience of other forms of democracy. And um, so I, I want that to be sort of something that we keep weaving in and back and forth in this talk is um, as much as there's so much pain and, and sorrow to confront um, mm -hmm. I think both you and I feel like we need to keep going and, and have some sort of, you know, naive maybe, but we have some thread of hope <laughs> because what else is there? Um, mm -hmm. and, and there are so many examples historically and contemporarily um, of hopefulness. Mm -hmm. um, so for the listeners out there, um, know that we, we will probably get dark, but we will also, um, we, are, we, are, we are in a context where we are trying to hold on to hope just as you all are mm -hmm. too. 
Um, so speaking of our wonderful anonymous audience, our future friends out there, whoever you are, um, there is a way where you can send in questions on the chat and I will do my best to multitask and uh, weave those questions in because I would love for this to be as much uh, an ongoing living conversation as these little boxes on the screen allow mm -hmm. us to do. So, mm -hmm. so uh, we launched right into it, but maybe we'll take a step back and just, um, you know, some people are just maybe seeing your work for the first time, don't know who the heck you are. Um, could you just talk a little bit about how you came to be so bold as to make a film called <laughs> What is Democracy? <laughs> um, just, just sort of a little bit of background of what, what was the itch you were scratching or, or how, or was it, you know, this moment of epiphany? Just talk a little bit about how this film came to be and then we'll get into the more juicy stuff. It's interesting, like, is it bold to ask a, make a film called What is Democracy or, or is so, it? It's so simple, it's like, it, you it's know. It's so it, simple, but that's right, the thing. Right. It's so Simple. And that's we, there's shame around Eating. asking simple right. questions. Right. It's like it's the it's air like, we're breathing, so it feels like we're we're supposed to already know or or you know yeah right. It's like these questions that you know for me I think you know one definition of a philosopher is someone who just asks these childlike questions like why are we here <laughs> seriously why are we here yeah you know what what is democracy what are we talking about and um. I, I, you know, I always have that philosophical itch. And for me, cinema, you know, this medium is about exploring ideas. And I do not know why. I mean, it's just the the thing I want to express in a visual form. And I uh, I think it's, I, don't, I just find it like a, an interesting challenge to do that. The question of democracy, you know, came to me in an incredibly earnest and urgent way around 2011 when I got sucked up into Occupy Wall Street and there were all of these protests around the world, the Arab Spring, the movement of the squares in, um, in Europe, um, protest movements in South America, and people were all saying, you know, we want democracy. So whether they were protesting a sort of, you know, dictatorship or they were protesting in what we would consider a social democracy or in the United States under, you know, um, you know, sort of capitalist <laughs> oligarchy, whatever this is. I was waiting and, to see yeah. what you were going to say. <laughs> and you know, this word democracy kept coming up, and I, I, and but at the same time, I was deeply involved in social movements, and and there, it's really frustrating. You know, a movement can say it's democratic, and there can be all sorts of problems and pitfalls, and and so I, I wanted to think about the word. Uh, it gets some distance from it because activism is very immersive, very reactive. So I thought, okay, I'll make a film at the same time so I can have a little distance, be more reflective. And a film would be a good medium for it because I could have this polyphony of voices and I could challenge some things about the democracy discourse, right? The fact that when we think of an expert of democracy, we think of a politician who's probably some, you know, lawyer <laughs> or, and if he's a congressperson or a senator, then he's a, you know, the average senator is a multimillionaire. So it's like, they're not average people. And um, I could also, you know, not only have academics and sort of ch uh, challenge this idea of who's an expert in democracy, who really has a valuable perspective. Um, but I think, I don't know, for me, like you talking about unschooling the, um, you know, in the, in the democratic school you ran, I mean, I was, I, was unschooled as a kid. I didn't go to school. I was raised by bohemian parents, countercultural parents. And for me, um, that was, I guess, a very powerful early experience in democracy, right? So my, mm -hmm. my mother aspired to non-coercive parenting. I didn't have to wake up at any time. I didn't have to go to bed. I didn't have to ever take a lesson. And um, now, now through my adult mind, I think, oh, it's kind of this Rousseauian, so like Jean-Jacques Rousseau, this Rousseauian idea that institutions are corrupting and, mm -hmm. you know, um, if we just set people free and the state of nature that is the household, the, the house in Athens, Georgia in 1988, wherever I was, you know, um, they'll, their intrinsic goodness will flourish. And, um, and so, you know, I was living this kind of political philosophy that now yeah. I have a critique of, but I also am really grateful for. And so I think that that question of democracy was was built into my unusual childhood and the fact that I, my parents from a young age just basically gave me the sense that, yeah, I had I had a voice. I, had a, I My opinion mattered and I was and a not, full person. Yeah, <laughs> and not just a voice, but that you 
had worth as an individual and that you, um, through your interests and your development, had interesting things to do and say, you know? I think that's, there's a, that's a big part of the question of democracy is does everyone have worth <laughs> yeah. just because they exist, you know? And I think unschooling um, can mm -hmm. be a way of telling that each child that they are worthy simply because they exist, you know? Um, Absolutely, and that's why yeah. people, hate, you know, critics of democracy hated it. They, they're still to this day, yeah. lots of arguments that there should be some barrier to entry. The idea that there's a system where there's no barrier to entry. I mean, you don't mm -hmm. have to have a degree. You know, mm -hmm. democracy post like 1965 or whatever. We now you know have the the ideal of one person one vote. You know, you shouldn't have to have a certain amount of income. You shouldn't have mm -hmm. you, you shouldn't have to be a certain gender or a certain race. Um, but to your question of, of, of worth, for me, a part of that, the, the flip side, the other component of that is just trust, right? And mm -hmm. I think that's part mm -hmm. of democratic education with children too, is you, you know, there's a yes. idea that you trust the child to be mm -hmm. a curious person, to be responsible. Mm -hmm. Democracy is you trust other people, mm -hmm. um, you know, to be engaged in this process of self rule. Mm -hmm. And so trust for me, I think is, this foundational component of all of it. And um, it's meted out in our society like it's the scarce resource, you know? Um, yeah. yeah. And child children's rights is something I'm still, I wrote something for the New York Times about it. I mean, I really think it's one of the last big um, forms of disenfranchisement. And I mm -hmm. think when you see kids striking for the climate and you see that young people are more informed about a lot of issues than older people, you know, I think that we use the same bad arguments to disenfranchise teenagers that we use to disenfranchise black people mm -hmm. and women yes. you know, not that long ago. Yeah, I've been really heartened to see the, um, you know, the movement to get uh, voting, the voting age down to 16, mm -hmm. really getting a lot of traction. Mm -hmm. um, and for people who are flabbergasted by that, it's, they need to be reminded that it's not that long ago that the voting age was reduced to 18 um, because, you know, you were old enough to die in a war, exactly. but you weren't old enough to vote for the country. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, those boundaries just keep getting pushed, hopefully, you know, in our lifetime and beyond. And mm -hmm. they'll, you know, yeah. Um, so looking back at the film you've made, um, mm -hmm. you know, it came about during the early days of Trump coming into power. Um, yeah. And now here we are. Um, I'm just wondering, um, you know, I just rewatched the film with my eight year old daughter and uh, it was so great to see it with her. And I, I'm i just moved by it all over again. So thank you for just making this Thanks, beautiful film that like you said, is such a beautiful weaving together of so many different voices. I mean, it just embodies the principle of democracy in its making. And I know from having worked on set with you that you embody that back, you know, behind the scenes too. So um, I just wanna pay, you know, pay my respects to that, pay my respects. No, I just yeah. wanna honor that. Yeah. Um, but looking back at the film, um, you know, there, there's there gotta be this very complicated emotion of um, like, I told you so, <laughs> because mm -hmm. I know when you made the film, there are many people who are like, well, that's a nice, like you said, childish question. Um, yeah. Those being yeah. sometimes the most important. But um, that there are many people who did not see the urgency of your question, or you know, just didn't see the context that was changing and making that question so much more urgent. So, in some ways, you're vind vindicated, and that also must feel horrible as <laughs> someone who, mm -hmm. you know. Um, it has dedicated her life to fighting for democracy in so many different ways. So I don't know what the German word for that is, but <laughs> there's some word mm -hmm. that describes that feeling. But I'm just wondering, looking back now, I don't know if you're the kind of filmmaker who can stand watching your own films, but what you remember of your film. Uh, yeah. Looking back now, what are, what are some things where you think, oh, I wish I had changed that, or I wish I had added mm -hmm. that, or, or oh, that mm -hmm. really resonates different. I'm just wondering, looking back, it's now, what, two years? Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. You know, it's funny. I people sometimes ask me that, and I'm like, I don't think like that. <laughs> you know, yes. because yeah, I I'm always on. You're to in the, the present. Next, <laughs> I'm in the present, and I'm always on to the next fight, the next yeah. curiosity. And for mm -hmm. me, I see each project as like birthing. Each one gives me this remnant that then mm. I then I you know when you have a snipping from a plant and then you yeah. grow a new one yeah. and like each one gives me something so. 
another way to tell the story of the democracy film is that it emerged out of my book on the internet because I was mm -hmm. critiquing these false Silicon Valley claims to yeah. be democratizing the mm -hmm. internet. And then I thought, well, what is the, what is, what would a demo mm -hmm. democratic internet look like? Um, I think the film, you know, it's interesting. I just said exactly what you just said to another friend last night because she was, she's been writing about environmental issues forever and an editor at a big publication and said, do you want to write about the fires in California? And she was like, what am I supposed to say? I've been warning, you know, I've written about climate change for 20 years. Yeah. And I just want to be, yeah. I want to grieve these fires. You yeah. Know? yeah. Like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there's no, and um, you know, I think I tried to paint the film so that it, the philosophical themes would be timeless. So I tried to structure it. One word that kept coming to me was parables. Like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, in years, years from now, even if we've forgotten the details of what happened in Greece, or um, maybe Donald mm -hmm. Trump's election will be seem far away, but will they still, will the parable of the demagogue still work in that? Or mm -hmm. will you recognize mm -hmm. the challenge of economic cooperation in the scene at the factory? Mm -hmm. Will you recognize um, the suffering of people who are excluded, you know, in these stories? Mm -hmm. And that trying to navigate I, I always thought of this project in terms of paradoxes. So the mm -hmm. book is literally structured that way of these contradictions in democracy that we'll never be able to resolve. And, the, and they're implicit in the film. So it's sort of that the democracy is both an ideal mm -hmm. and it's this messy reality. It's both, uh, you know, it's intellectual and it's emotional. It's, um, it's global and it's local. Mm -hmm. And put, like moving from those, those registers and, mm -hmm. And so I guess I, you know, I tried to just cram as many of those as I could into 90 minutes or well, I, I sort of been. asked that question because I was struck by how, how timely it still felt. I mean, not, not that it, mm -hmm. you know, not that I was expecting it wouldn't, but I was just really struck by that. And I, I think it's because you were able to do that and you, you didn't make caricatures out of people, but you were mm -hmm. able to heighten what they were saying into what you, yeah, sort of these parables or these thorny questions, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is um, just one of my favorite things about your work is that it really, you are so um, rigorous and comfortable in being in the questions. And, you know, mm -hmm. as much as activism does require us to move and, and function and make quick decisions and, and, and craft policies, I do really appreciate that your creative work is a space where you are asking questions and are engaging in different, um, in trying to get different voices in to weigh mm -hmm. in on those questions and not settling in something that, you know, is um, demagoguery ultimately. Well, this reminds yeah. me of a conversation, one of our many mind blowing conversations that we had. I don't think it was this for you, but it was like one for me. And I don't, I, I don't know when it was, but we were coming back, I think we were coming back from Morocco Okay. Right. And you and I was having a crisis of what I call in retrospect, my crisis of moral relativism, because I had been this like child activist. And I say that, like, I just was like this 12 year old Cassandra being like, the animals are dying, the earth is dying, you know, the, everyone should listen to me, I have it all figured out. You know, and you're selling yourself short. You were doing some <laughs> great teenage activism. But yeah. Go ahead. But and then I think I sort of had this moment where I thought, like, you know, where nobody people like it didn't work. I felt my friends didn't become vegetarian, and my yeah. family pushed back on me. And so I had right. this moment where I was like, okay, you're like the being, Lorax. <laughs> being a being a proselytizer doesn't work. So I was like, right. fine, I'm going to do something different. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to disengage. It's just, it's too painful. And also, who am I to think that I have all the answers? You know, mm -hmm. I am being a dogmatic person. And you, and I think I sort of said in a much more sort of teenage way, right? Like, I'm done with this. I'm, you know, like, <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> and, uh, and you said, you were just like, we have a responsibility mm -hmm. to other people. You know, we have this, and you kept saying that we have a responsibility, and it really gave me, you know, it was like this call back to my my myself, my old way of being. And I remember thinking that word because I mean I don't know why my, I was like respond. What if I what if I put the responding the response mm -hmm. in response responsibility? In other mm -hmm. words, it's not me proselytizing, being dogmatic, but actually mm -hmm. me responding and trying to listen and learn what what happens when the ethics come from that. And mm -hmm. I think that. 
that conversation actually sort of, you know, you can see it manifesting in my emphasis on questioning in the film and on listening, mm -hmm. and really putting listening at the center of democracy and democratic mm -hmm. being mm -hmm. and listening at the center of being an intellectual and making a philosophical movie, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is a movie about ideas. It's about Plato. But I always just, I, I'm always there asking questions and trying to learn more. Mm -hmm. And I think it's that, yeah, it's that, to me, it goes back to that encounter and thinking, okay, well, what is, what does it mean to be responsible to the world, but in a way that is like truly being permeable and being um, in this position of, you know, and not this convention, I don't know what exactly it is, but it's not that conventional position of the authority, mm -hmm. uh, the, you know. Well, that's the, our the, models of leadership and power, uh, yeah. right? And, and so listening and and um, is often seen as passive. It's yes. seen as, you know, it, it's seen as soft and weak. And, feminine. Uh, and feminine, yes. Um, and so I, I think what your film does is it, because you are being such a careful and caring listener, you are asking us as the audience to enter that space too. And so I think, I wonder how, how people who are not used to that watch your film and, and, and if that mm -hmm. causes them discomfort and that, you know, maybe they just stop watching it. <laughs> <laughs> they never, yeah, but no, I just, yeah. I think, I think it, you know, I, I think we've talked a little bit about this in other conversations, but that is, it is, it is a conscious feminist act to, position yourself as a as an active listener as a compassionate listener as yeah. an empathetic listener um and i think that's one of the things that i love so much about your film and i find so moving um so yeah yeah i think you know i mean i think listening is the the un under theorized underappreciated twin of the right to free speech that we talk so much about you know mm -hmm. it's that mm -hmm. you know we we don't really pause to think about the fact our our right to hear diverse voices to hear from all kinds of people is also being undermined in mm -hmm. all of these ways you know mm -hmm. and um and i think i think there's a real gendered component to it well i was thinking that we would give folks a chance to listen um mm -hmm. i love this um clip with um the uh, barber in miami and just as such a beautiful example of that kind of listening. Um, do you want to play that one or is there something else that? I like whatever you want. I haven't seen the movie in so like a oh, okay. long time. So well, surprise me. Um, <laughs> Jason, what do you think about playing that one? I don't know. I feel like it's just greed, corruption, just taking over the whole thing, man. There was a story, they do this huge investigation and turns out that the um the head of the sec that's investigating the um the chase bank corporation they were frat buddies with the ceo i'm literally reading this i'm like i can't believe how is it that this guy was actually allowed to prosecute like his own like it just it's amazing to me and wouldn't you believe it the guy got off could you believe that, you know? So I guess that's democracy, right? When the judge walks down and gives you a hug and says, all right, you ready to go to trial? I guess that's democracy. Yeah. Um, he goes on to talk um, a lot about his own activism in prison to save um, their rights to education in the library. And it's a very, yeah, it's a really moving part of the film. How did you find him? What's his name, first of all? Do you remember? Oh, I think you're a sound. <laughs> his name's Ellie Brett. Can you hear okay. me now? Yes, yeah. thank you. Um, I found him because I found, I was in Miami and I, I went to Miami because, um, it was actually sort of in the, in the aftermath of the first wave of Black Lives Matter protests. So mm -hmm. protests mm -hmm. around the murder of Trayvon Martin yeah. and, um, and you know, just this, yeah. been this enormous uprising, uprising uh, just like gathering of this new burgeoning social movement and there's a group called the dream defenders that's still on the front lines is really amazing and i was interested in going there though because it was actually this moment of calm where the group 
didn't quite know what the next move was. And I was quite interested in that. I mean, being an organizer, it's not every, every period is this exciting moment where you're organizing the big demonstration or you're, mm -hmm. you know, having the meeting at, in Washington and, mm -hmm. and having the confrontation. A lot of it is kind of those in-between phases where you're trying to figure out what the next step is. Um, and I met this woman who had been working in the criminal justice system and then she became disheartened. So she started this amazing community podcast called Probation Station. And she basically gave advice. I mean, in this really like grassroots way. And so her show people would be calling in and they'd be asking advice of, you know, what to do about their parole or bail and all these things. And I just asked her, hey, you know, do you know anyone who you would call a philosopher? Mm -hmm. And she said, yeah, I know this guy, Ellie. And it turned out he had seen Examine Life. I mean, he was like, he, <laughs> so he was really so um, enthusiastic, but what was quite funny is his boss at the barbershop, I think thought we were gonna do an interview about cutting hair. Uh. And he was not happy with how oh, political I got. Oh. So, um, so that. And what about was, the customer? I love that. I love how you include this man. Yeah, the customer. So that guy was. I mean, he didn't convey it enough for it to like kind of become part two of the yeah. conversation. But I did interview him, and he had spent a long time in. Uh, in prison, mm -hmm. and his attitude was more jaded. He was sort of like some, you know, there's some bad guys. Right. And right. Um, and so actually, I think it was like a really interesting conversation for him to listen to because you could see the things kind of turning there. That uh -huh, uh -huh. He was more buying into the conventional morality and the right, conventional, right. Um, sense that, you know, OK, punishment's legitimate. And Ellie was really challenging that and being affirmed by, you know, by us, um, yeah. by me and my crew. So it was a really powerful conversation. And yeah. You know, you know, what I think what's interesting about the film is I didn't do a lot of interviews that didn't make it in. You oh, know, really? I'm not, I'm not like a, I don't really like to film. <laughs> I like to read and write. So you have to, it's like not really, you know, I, I'm not someone who shoots 600 hours to uh -huh. get a movie. Mm -hmm. No, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I work. I want to just, that's why I have to employ the six. Yeah. To really yeah. Get, I have to know I'm yeah. going, going yeah. in. Yeah. And then connecting. That, yeah. Make that connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there is a question from someone. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you, Mara, for asking. And it's, um, if you were to add a chapter to your film or explore yeah. another paradox of democracy set in 2020, or maybe with the knowledge yeah. of 2020 now, what would it be? Yeah. Well, like I said, I kind of lead into things. So I'm sort of doing it. Mm -hmm. I think there was a chapter that I could have written in the book, and I did regret in a way not doing it. Um, and I, I think I didn't do it because I'm trying to live it. And so it almost felt like oh, it's already too much of my life. Mm -hmm. And it's the paradox of the individual and the collective because mm -hmm. democracy is a collective enterprise. And but part of the, the beauty of its promise is that we will individually be able to be free mm -hmm. and cultivate our unique humanity. Mm -hmm. And so that's this real tension in mm -hmm. inherent to democracy. And, you know, in my opinion, we need these mediating institutions, mm -hmm. the, the community, the, the institutions of community and also mm -hmm. of um, political action. So unions, associations. And so I have spent, you know, the vast majority of my time and energy and sort of passion building a debtors union called the Debt Collective. Um, that is essentially like a, akin to the labor movement, right? You know, people organize in the workplace around the wage and our idea is, well, everyone's indebted in this world. So why don't people organize around the fact they have student loans and medical debt and mm -hmm. credit card debt? Um, but I think there's, I think the thing is that we can have all this discussion and we can have all this analysis and we can look at what's happening in horror, but if we're not organized, we won't be able to change it. We have to build power to challenge power so that the paradox between the individual and the collective is really key. So I'm writing about it now. Um, I'm working on a book about solidarity, which I think yeah. is sort of the glue, right? It's the bond mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. that builds that, those mediating institutions. And solidarity is a really, um, it's something, it's a word we say a lot and it's something that we all know is necessary, but it's actually really under, even more than democracy. There are books about democracy. There's almost no books about solidarity, the history of the idea mm -hmm. um, and, and how of 
mm-hmm. of doing this. And so I think the uh, the motivating question and to get to 2020 is why is it why is it easier to divide us than to unite us? Like mm-hmm. why or and or what are the but also to be a bit more utopian, what are the ways we're united and the ways we have solidarity and the ways we're kind that we don't appreciate because mm-hmm. we go unnamed. Mm-hmm. And so that's where I want to channel my friend David Graeber, the anarchist who, anthropologist who just passed away, who wrote this beautiful book called Debt and wrote all these, you know, big best-selling books. And he was just such a, a radical, um, idealistic person. And one thing he said is, you know, think of all the work that goes into making us ignore and not see all of the cooperation, mm-hmm. what he called the everyday communism of life, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Um, if, if you know, I see someone in the street and they need help. I don't say, give me five bucks before I'm going to help you out. Mm-hmm. Right. And there's mm-hmm. all of this solidarity around us. And yeah. um, it's just and not monetized. <laughs> it's not monetized, then, but it's not named. And then there's yeah. so much work that goes into actually making us alienated, making us competitive, dividing us. And so, um, so I'm kind of thinking through thinking through these things for this new project. Oh, I'm so excited it's, about yeah, that. It's going to be short. Yeah, right. <laughs> I was just yeah. Um, yeah. There's another question that just came up. Should we jump? I, I want to like include all these voices, but I also don't want to jump too much. Um, let's see. Let's take a moment because you brought up the Deck Collective, and I do want to honor mm-hmm. that work. Um, yeah. uh, could we show the video uh, of the Deck Collective? This is a, this again? Is a propaganda video. This is. I this think it'll get us all very. Yeah, I think it'll make us very excited to see fire. I have $50,000 of student debt. I left college with about $30,000 in student debt. $22,000 in student loans. $70,000 worth of student debt. $180,000 of student debt. Supposedly we have 28,000 left for uh, illegitimate edu- education. They can go to hell because I'm not going to pay it. <laughs> Fuck the Department of Education. <laughs> I'm joining the strike and I'm not going to pay. Today, I'm going to burn this in solidarity with all of you, with all my family. I'm standing with all of you guys in solidarity. We're going to burn this debt together, guys. This is for all the indebted students. May they be free. I am here, even though you can't see me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, I can't hear you. That was my turn to mess up. Um, so that brought up the theme of solidarity right in our face. So that was yeah. great. Um, could you talk a little bit about um, debt and inequality and poverty and, and how central it is to democracy? Because that comes up in the film quite yeah. a lot. Um, and now it's, you know, so much the focus of your work and, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So I'm going to do the practical conversation about that in the philosophical sense. So, you know, that video is a propaganda, propaganda video for the debt collective. And the idea is essentially that our debts are somebody else's assets. And so if people come together, they can wield a kind of collective power. And we've demonstrated this. We launched a student debt strike in 2015. It began with 15 students from a predatory for-profit college. And we have won over a billion dollars with a B, a billion dollars of debt cancellation for tens of thousands of students. And we've been in a battle with Betsy DeVos. And we, the debt collective, was instrumental in putting the idea of student debt cancellation on the 2020 uh, Democratic agenda. Um, you know, and now Biden is saying he'll raise $10,000 of student debt. Um, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, we're all using, we're all committing to using a mechanism for erasing debt that our team developed, 
are, um, you know, so this small group of people um, doing something that seemed really wild, uh, you know, has has shifted the conversation, and we haven't we haven't won yet. But it's it's we've gone from being laughed at to you know the New Yorker magazine saying things like, well, of course there's going to be some student debt cancellation, some mass cancellation. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So you know, and I think it's it's figuring out new identities, right? So we want people to say, oh, I have this condition. I also can't pay my bills, and you can't pay your bills. I might live in a city, you might live in the countryside. I might be old, you might be young. I might be black, you might be white. You know, but hey, this is a new way of thinking about ourselves and our common mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. conditions or common oppression. And this is something that speaks very deeply to the history of democracy, mm -hmm. and it's in its de debt is right there at the center of Plato's Republic. The mm -hmm. fundamental moral question posed at the beginning is, you know, is it moral? To, <laughs> do you have to pay your debts, right? Mm -hmm. um, Athenian democracy, Roman democracy, would, to the degree that it was democratic, were born of debtors' revolts because what happened is, you know, the harvest would go bad, people would fall into arrears and end up selling themselves or their children into slavery and become mm -hmm. debt peons. So debt. Um, debt and democracy is just, they're, they're two things that go together yeah. through history. Um, it works on the level of the nation state. You look at Haiti, a country where there was the first multiracial, truly democratic revolt, the first successful slave revolt. Well, what happened to Haiti? It was punished with um, a huge um, debt that um, dragged the country down, a debt to France. So this mm -hmm. colonial debt, and we see this, um, we see this in all sorts of, uh, nations today, a kind of neo-colonial form mm -hmm. of anti-democratic mm -hmm. um, uh, domination through debt. And, yeah. and so I think there's, there's just something there that we have to, we have to really grapple with. Um, and debt is, I think part of what, you know, on a philosophical level too, the thing with debt is it's, it binds you, it binds your future because, you know, if you have a, an 18 year old kid and you say you're gonna have to go into debt for you know and pay it off for 30 years for the right to get an education that constrains their choices it constrains their sense of possibility there's lots of academic research that shows people become way more risk averse because they know they have to make those monthly payments it really is a it's a it is a form of social control and in fact mm -hmm. um Reagan intended it. I, I just published a piece in the New Republic a huge piece on the history of the university and basically Ronald Reagan, when he was governor of California, imposed student debt, imposed tuition because he wanted people to stop protesting and mm -hmm. stop. Uh, he said his quote was, "The state shouldn't subsidize curiosity. You mm -hmm. know, should mm -hmm. be uh, education should be a commodity people have to pay for." Um, but this really gets right into this question about populism because mm -hmm. populism is such a. So someone asked, "Does populism yeah. come up for you looking at democracy in your film and book?" Populism is this word that. Mm -hmm. um, like the, the the even more obscure sequel to what is democracy could be what is populism, <laughs> and um, and uh, you know, so populism has a kind of bad reputation today. It's used as though it's a synonym for sort of all the bad parts of democracy, mm -hmm, right? Sort of mm -hmm. the masses out of control. Um, and so I'm quite I'm kind of pretty suspect of some of the people who bash populism because there's a kind of anti democratic aspect to to that discourse that that mm -hmm. I think the problems of our democracy today are not the problems of the majority, they're the problems of minor, more minority rule, minoritarian structures like the Supreme Court, Senate. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that, you know, money in politics means that this, you know, very wealthy people and entities have more say. So I'm more concerned about the tyranny of the minority in 2020 mm -hmm. than the tyranny of the majority. So for me, populism right. isn't the main problem. Mm -hmm. And populism historically has been a pretty interesting movement. I mean, there were, you know, after the Civil War, there were these attempts to have a kind of multiracial populism. And it was often, you know, debt was at the center of it, right? Mm -hmm. Because poor people have debt. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, there were demands for other kinds of economic arrangements for nationalization of the banks and, uh, you know, public money. And so, you know, I'm, I'm for reclaiming the word populism, just like I'm for reclaiming the word um, democracy and being more precise when we name the problem. So not mm -hmm. saying the problem is populism, but saying the problem is, you know, the problem is uh, capitalism, the problem is racism, the problem is fascism, mm -hmm. the problem mm -hmm. is minority, um, the problem is all these minority veto points in our democracy that actually 
undermine the mm -hmm. majoritarian components. I mean, there's lots of things the majority of Americans want. Mm -hmm. Despite all the misinformation, despite all the, you know, it's yeah. like people want yeah. action on climate change. We don't right. have it because of minoritarian yeah. structures right. of right. control. So mm -hmm. populism is an interesting word and it's really one that's being battled over. I just yeah. haven't made that word the center of my rhetorical uh, skirmishes. Yeah, yeah. Well, each of these words can be contorted mm -hmm. in so many different ways. So mm -hmm. um, I think that's what mm -hmm. brought you to make this film is to really try to tease out this question of democracy mm -hmm. and populism feeds into that mm -hmm. as well, yeah. Um, so we, I, I guess we don't have too much time, but we have a little bit of time. I wanted to talk to you just on a personal level. What was what were, what were the hardest things about making this film? And I ask that because I kind of want to get into this conversation with you about just how you keep your spirits up and 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 what keeps you motivated. And I kind of want to start with the specifics of, you know, mm -hmm. what was challenging in making the film. I mean, you um, obviously there's a million hours of research and the you know and and the logistics on the ground. But just I'm wondering in in speaking with certain people, did you have moments where you felt really broken down or, or, mm -hmm. or, or, or things were difficult in other ways? Um, yeah, yeah. It's, I think part of, I mean, there's the, the, the part of why I prefer to write, I mean, so this is just a person, this is like a, a much, this is the simple side to what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, a film requires you have to raise so much money. There's so mm -hmm. many people involved. So I, that pressure of kind of feeling like the stakes are a bit higher is not my favorite sense. That's part of why I like the type, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's low budget. Um, but part of why I made, I mean, okay, so this goes back to our history. And so mm -hmm. Polina was my wonderful film teacher. I mean, and I'm talking literally my teacher, like <laughs> Polina taught me the word B-roll. And she taught me that you transcribe the footage. And she taught me how to use Final Cut Pro. And we, we, as you know, in this kind of cliche way, as 20 year olds went to Senegal to make a film for an, for an NGO. And even then, and I, I, you know, I think both of us felt that there's something really, you know, the dynamic, right, of going somewhere that you're not part of the community. You know, I mean, I couldn't even speak French, at least you could communicate. <laughs> Um, it's a part of why I so looked up to Polina. She just seems so worldly compared to me and multilingual and, um, you know, it could turn the camera on. And, I'm, glad, uh, I'm glad I tricked you. <laughs> but um, yeah, there's something about, you know, that, that question of like knowing a place or at least being in a position where you could mm -hmm. honor it. And for me, this sense of actually to come back to the word responsibility of if you're asking someone to participate in your film, how can you be responsible to them? And that's not just through re mm -hmm. representation. It's all, it's, it, for me, it has to go beyond that encounter of the, of the, of the filming, right? I mean, it's, it's a fraught ethical relationship. And I think that's part of why I chose in my feature films to make films about philosophers, because I made the film about Zizek, I was 23, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. When I started making Examine Life, I was 27. And so I'm, filming people who have tenure, they're intellectual celebrities. Mm -hmm. And so I felt very comfortable in the power dynamic, right? I felt yeah. um, mm -hmm. I felt that, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna let these people down. They don't really need me. I mean, I need to be yeah. respectful in my editing and I need mm -hmm. to not, you know, be a shit, <laughs> but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the kid here. And I think for what is democracy, I felt that I could finally have a different dynamic. I could film mm -hmm. people and carry that responsibility, carry that burden. And so, mm -hmm. you know, it was very intense filming, for example, at the factory, which is only a few hours from where I am right now mm -hmm. in, in Morganton, North Carolina, it was the day after Trump won. Wow. And, and that was a scene where I promised them, you know, A, I said, I don't have to come film. You know, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. I said, I'm going to give you the final cut and you can tell me if I can't use it. And I flew all the way down to North Carolina, drove mm -hmm. to the factory at five in the morning. And we had a whole the, the whole group watched wow. the scene and mm -hmm. we had a whole dialogue. And ultimately, um, the team actually said it was up to the woman, you know, because she's the most yeah. vulnerable in it. Yeah. 
So, and then I had a long um, relationship and still I'm in relationship with Abid and Salam. And um, so I think that, yeah, um, you know, it's a really, it's like our relation, our world is full of these horrible power imbalances and we have power, you know, yeah. and, you know, making a film is an enormous privilege. And it's, I, to me, it's just not enough to be like, well, I'm making a film and I'm going to raise awareness. I mean, it's, yeah. that's why I'm an organizer. It's like, yeah. you know, we don't really need more awareness. <laughs> we need power. Yeah. And, um, but also we do need to be accountable to people. So I, I, mm -hmm. you know, it took me into, you know, real adulthood to feel like I was ready to take that on. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, it's, yeah. and it's, it's a lot, there's real sadness, you know? And I think for me, it was important that the film be emotional, I, but it was, it's like, you don't want to, I didn't want it to be a human interest story. You don't story. want to be exploitative. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to be exploitative. And it's not a human interest story. So it's like, it has to go to the personal and touch the pain and then zoom out and be like, we're not really going to be able to follow this person. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Or also like, or, or, or address their pain without yeah. being political and right, thinking right. philosophically and being like, how did this come about? Right. Through, through mm -hmm. all these centuries of colonialism and imperialism and, mm -hmm. and, and greed. So, yeah. You know, that balance, I want that I struggle a lot in the editing room of like um the personal, the, yeah, the personal, the personal and the collective. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. That balance. But yeah. The, yeah. I mean this, you know, I mean, yeah, a lot of it really hurt my heart, you know. I mean, that's the thing. You you know, I mm -hmm. I think that, you know, that's also part of my critique of like democratic theory and political science is just like it's not it's not real enough you know mm -hmm, i mean mm -hmm, this is mm -hmm, mm -hmm. this it, this is the i took corner less it's like the raw funky stank of life it's like mm -hmm. we've got to address pain and trauma and and grief and you know and hope and all of this stuff and you know it's not just like we're not going into democracy as robots mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah Janet wants us to talk, uh, wants you to talk a little bit more about the um, refugee mm -hmm. camp scene. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe Janet can tell us more what she's looking for, but I mean, maybe she's bringing that up because that is maybe one of the hardest scenes because you just feel this overwhelming hopelessness in that scene. And yet there's this young woman who is so hopeful in this, in, in, in what seems like impossible circumstances. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, so that was, I mean, Piraeus port is yeah. the famous port where Plato sets the Republic too. And so it's, that's this historical dimension is underneath mm -hmm. that scene because yeah. Piraeus port, even 2,500 years ago was a port and it was a site where all of these people from different regions encountered each other mingled and it was a site of sort of democratic contestation even then mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so the port has this this uh this history this legacy yeah. yeah this legacy and so i was there filming on what would be one of the last days when these huge ferries were coming in from the islands because it would be right when the eu turkey deal was taking place mm -hmm. and i felt this thing of like oh my god who am i to show up here with a camera i mean you know this is you know it's I really have to push myself to do that. And then when I caught a glimpse of Salam, she was like shouting at some guy, you know, and yeah. I sort of had this moment where I thought, okay, I know that I need to talk to her. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, I mean, her story following that, I mean, is incredible. Uh, she and her brother did eventually make it to Austria, to Graz. She just got married. Her Aww. family, her mother lived, her family was able to be reunited. I oh, stayed in touch with her this you. whole time and that. she's yeah. um she's doing really well. They, you know, are very worried about me <laughs> in the United States during COVID, which is very sweet. Oh. Um but she and her brother, they went the Balkan route and they were literally like outside for six months, just they were stuck in Serbia for a while. It was it was really a brutal time and they got in Aust they got to Austria right as the far right was rising and so she was harassed by neo-Nazis for um, much of the few months she got there who were wow. like yeah. uh, attacking her apartment in the middle of the night. I mean, really um, terrible to 
you know, not meet this, not encounter this place where you think there's going to be human rights and these, you know, right. supposed Western right. values, but instead there's a lot of, you know, assholes. Yeah. And, um, uh, but I wanted to show her with that accordion. So one is I had just ended, you know, I went right from, uh, I had, had joined my husband's rock band and been playing and I played, one of the instruments I played was the accordion and mm -hmm. the accordion and I had a very complex relationship because that instrument is persnickety. Hard. <laughs> it's a hard <laughs> instrument to play and you do one squeeze off and you're mic'd and it's a mess. And then I found, you know, I'm talking to Salma and she says, I'm a music student. Da, da, da. And she was an accordion player. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And it just felt like this, you know, magical, yeah, yeah this magical moment. And so um, I filmed her with the accordion and I eventually brought her my accordion um, and took it to her after she made it to Austria. So, wow. But I wanted to show that too, to yeah. show like she's a whole person, right? She's yeah. a whole person and she has a, an artistic side and an artistic yeah. soul. And, you know, we're not just victims. We're not just um, stereotypes, right? Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that your film does so well is each person we meet, mm -hmm. they, you know, generally they surprise us, which, yeah. you know, reflects back on us what we were, what we maybe were stereotyping them as, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and part of that is because we're used to stories where people are caricatures. They are victims. They are the sad other or whatever yeah. it is, however we've cast them, you know, they are. And, and in our democracy, you know, Ellie is cast as, as the ungrateful, unworthy yeah. felon, you know, like that, that becomes his identity rather than the whole beautiful person that he is, who is striving to educate himself and organize his, yeah. um, you know, fellow prison mates. So, yeah. yeah and, yeah, and you, have, you no. to get to find that you have to be willing to really have a conversation and not interview people, right? Because mm -hmm. you have to be willing to go in places or in directions you didn't anticipate. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's one of the the things. There's um there's a filmmaker named Petty Honigman who I really admired. Do you know mm -hmm. her work? A little bit. And, um, and she, I saw a Q and A with her, and she said, you know, I just she really hates. She said something like, "They're not subjects; mm -hmm. they're people." Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and that would be one of the mantras, you know, before I would talk to someone. This isn't a yeah. subject. Well, and, and isn't that, you know, what we could say for democracy? We're not mm -hmm. subjects, we're people. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, subjects yeah. has a very good resonance in that because to be subjected, yeah. right, to be the subject of the king or the, is literally to be, you know, the, le the, the less than, the oppressed. Right. Yeah, yeah. So we are, you know, subject to time. <laughs> and our, um, that still seems to be the, the case. Um, I do want to end with thinking about um, this question of hope and hopefulness. Um, and you do so much work that um, addresses so many large, seemingly insurmountable difficulties, you know, student debt, collective debt. Um, what keeps you hopeful? What keeps you going? Oh no, I've lost everyone. Hello, I'm all alone. Hello? Okay. Have we lost Astra for good? She's here okay. somewhere. She's, she's out there scoring the corners of her quarantine house looking for hope. She's gathering it together in a... <laughs> in a I'm back. Okay, hope did you gather all your hope up? I did. I there I am. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. Hey, oh. oh, it's okay. We're almost I'm on done. the different connection. <laughs> okay. Tell the internet to hold on for five more minutes. Jeez. <laughs> okay. Let's give the people some hope, Astra. Yeah. <laughs> so you want my hope? Are we? Are, are we well, going to go for it? Say what you have to say because I didn't hear it. Oh, okay. Um, I was just, you know, you are confronting so many um, seemingly insurmountable challenges in your work. You know, mm -hmm. the idea of debt, the idea of inequality, the idea of um, unequal and unfair representation, poverty. Um, how do you personally wake up each day and, and keep going? How do you keep having hope? What, what gives you hope? Yeah, I mean, you know, just a small softball question here. <laughs> there is, I mean, I. I hope what comes out in my films is that I do take a kind of intellectual pleasure in this. You know, there's a, I have a lot of pleasure in the life of the mind. I mean, this mm -hmm. is what 
I am about. And I love to think through these puzzles and ponder them and try to share what nuggets I've gleaned. I mean, I like this. <laughs> um, and in my study, um, you know, it's like, study and struggle it, those are my two modes and in my study what i see looking at history is how unpredictable things are i mean mm -hmm. we are in a desperate time especially with the climate and we've known that this was coming and we're in a time i think of uh real grief with covid and all these lives being lost because of a total irresponsibility and insensitivity um and greed um on the part of the people who are you know at the helm right now um but things have been bad in the past you know people have lived at the end of the world in various ways and yet there have also been these tremendous breakthroughs so in the at the end of the book i have this image where i say you know i don't want us to fetishize founding fathers like oh one day we're gonna figure out democracy and write it all out and make the rules and that'll be it it's like i want us to be perennial midwives birthing you know, this possibility anew mm -hmm. and, you know, aspiring to, to better democratic problems. <laughs> that's like, that's my motto is like, you know, let's get over this. We shouldn't have to wrestle with this stupid thing of like, should three billionaires have half the wealth and are women yeah. equal to men? And should trans people be allowed yeah. to move freely in space? Yeah. Like, let's, okay. Yeah. If we could just get through all that, there's so many thorny democratic problems that we could be addressing. Um, and, uh, you know, I, the long view, I mean, again, to channel my friend David Graper, I mean, he's he would think of these thousand year chunks, you know, debt, 5000 years. And it's and, you know, I do believe I'm of the opinion we've entered a phase of capitalism around 1970. People call it neoliberalism, whatever. I mean, we're like half a century in, <laughs> you yeah. know, yeah. Um, we're figuring out new ways to organize. Um, and I think there's there are uh, there are lots of possibilities. I mean, and there are also lots of victories to be had. I'm very worried about this election. I don't think elections are all democracy is, but um, I'm also very heartened by the rising generation that's organizing at the state level and running primary campaigns. Um, I wrote a piece in The New Yorker about progressive primary challengers. Almost everybody I wrote about won. I interviewed Cori Bush, who's from Missouri, um, Jamal Bowman in New York. Yeah. Um, this group, you know, these 20 somethings are running these organizations and getting progressive, bold uh, people to challenge the Demo that capital, big D, <laughs> democratic yeah. establishment. Yeah. Rhode Island, where you and I met. Yeah. Um, Reclaim Rhode Island, a brand new group that some friends of mine have been helping to organize, got behind all these challengers. I think they all won um, yeah. in this primary season. So I think yeah. one thing I'll say about liberals and the Democrats the left is we haven't paid as much attention as the right wing to local politics, state politics. And, you know, that that kind of hard work has to be done. And but when people do it, there's people can still win at that level. So um, you know, I think there's there's lots of cause for alarm, but there's also lots of um cause for holding on. Yeah. And there's lots of work to be done. Yeah, and lots of work to be done. And and um and Hopefully me sharing my, my nerdery will help some people. <laughs> well, I want to end with you and another wonderful nerd, um, Cornell West, who has appeared in your other film. Um, and he kind of will send us off um, with just reminding that we, you know, really before us, the challenge is just to remain hopeful. And you can call that foolish, but that is what that is the work. It's the so are we going to give are we going to give Cornell the last word and sign off? I think so. I think our you know the yeah. god of time is ticking yeah. at us. Well, I just want to say I love you and I'm grateful I love that you, you did too. this. Thank you um, so much. This was so much fun. I was very anxious and and then it was just a joyride. So thank you. And I'm just going to jump in for a second and remind you that if you'd like to support the Living Room series, you can click on offers and donate to the CCA. Donate to all of your cultural organizations because we all need your help now. And um, we yes. didn't talk about the importance of the arts and cultural to the democratic process, but we think it's essential here at the CCA. So please donate. Yeah. Thank you both for being here. It was such an honor and a treat. And what a great way to spend a Friday night. And um, it's great to give Cornell the last word. So 
Thank okay. you. And and thank the you all. Organization for Women says you guys must come visit once. Um, <laughs> Well, travel is again allowed. I've so. heard it's a nice place. <laughs> so next year in Santa Fe. Okay. Thank you all so much. It seems to me that real democracy, if it's going to work, it demands a certain intellectual engagement and wrestling with ideas, deliberation. Mm. But do you think people want to rule themselves? Well, it's a tough question. Dostoevsky raised the question, is it not the case that most people fear freedom? Is it not the case that most people would rather be followers of authority rather than authorize themselves? That's the Dostoevsky challenge. Uh, in that sense, Dostoevsky is like Plato. Plato's challenge to democracy, Dostoevsky's challenge to people who want to be free. How many people really want to be free? James Baldwin said, very few. The burden is too much. Tell me what to do. Dangle in my face the mysteries turning into magic and the authorities dictating how I ought to live my life. That's most people, as Brother Karamazov, the classic of Dostoevsky, the last text of Dostoevsky. It's a very important challenge. I think that, again, like Plato and like Dostoevsky, we never provide a theoretical response that is persuasive because there's always so much historical evidence that they're right. They got to point out ignorance. They got to point out unruly passion. They got to point out people being deferential to authority in a critical way. They've got to point out narrow conceptions of piety where people have blind obedience to authority, be it church, mosque, synagogue, government, television shows, radio shows, or whatever. There's tons of evidence for that. That's what we're up against in human history. That's why democracy is always an over-against practice, an over-against phenomena. And therefore, there's a sense in which we look foolish Anybody who goes against the dominant tendencies of human history, which are those of hatred and revenge and domination, oppression and subordination and domination, what a fool. And you say, yes, count me in the crowd of the holy fools. <laughs>